we switch a little bit gears and we I would like you to welcome with me of course uh, Professor Bruce Beutler together with Algeri Dopilopoulos on the stage. The idea is now to be able to discuss with, with these two scientists and I remind you that uh, many of you had the opportunity yesterday to listen to Professor Beutler's lecture at the Academy of Athens. Those of you that didn't, uh, they should come to tonight at the university where he is having another lecture. Um, and uh, we will have the opportunity to listen to his lectures in this way. We invited here, here to, him here today uh, together with Algiri Tavlopoulos to open up the, uh, to the audience um, the wisdom that these two men carry with them and uh, to ask them anything we like from science to society to um, you know more personal things of the life of the life of the scientists personal for science <laughs> all right I don't know, maybe they will take some more personal questions also. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's uh, uh, welcome uh, uh, these two people. Professor Bruce Boitler, uh, please. something that touched on genetics at many points, also a lot on mechanism. I used to be a cytokine biologist. That was how I began my career, and that was sort of fortuitous. Really, I wanted to be a neuroscientist at some time in my life. That was why I did a neurology residency. And I thought that would be the road to understanding neuroscience, mysteries like consciousness, all kinds of questions that we all wonder about. But it didn't work out that way. My career was influenced by external events. It happened that I isolated an important cytokine. And at that point, I became quite committed to immunology, to innate immunity, and I moved forward that way. But I will say that the midpoint of my career, uh, I had a sort of epiphany it's a Greek word, right? <laughs> so you all know epiphany. I realized the power of genetics, which I should have seen much earlier, because I had a lot of exposure to genetics in college and even before college. Uh, but I never really saw it at those days, because one could, for example, in fruit flies, map a, a phenotype. And that was the end of it. You couldn't ever find the gene. You couldn't really move forward. Things changed in the mid-1980s, and it became possible to track down the phenotype, really find the gene, understand the protein that was critical for the function. And to do this in an unbiased manner was something I really loved. So I hope a lot of you like genetics. Of course, there are many ways to do science. <coughs> to me, the greatest uh, problem with all of biological science, maybe all science, when one makes hypotheses is that people tend to fall in love with their hypotheses. And I was no exception. And uh, I uh, had trouble policing myself and being really sure to test the hypothesis rather than to try to prove it. You all do that, I suppose. You test it. You never say, I proved the hypothesis. So, with genetics, the question didn't even come up because there was no guess about what was going on. You could guess to amuse yourself, but in the end it just mattered whether you could find the gene or not that was mutated to cause such and such phenotype. And I've never been so happy since that time that I switched over and began simply trying to damage the genome at random <coughs> to create new phenotypes. And many of them were very, very interesting. I had a discussion about this with Ari the other day. I tend to like the explorational side of science. I 
look toward mechanistic explanations too, but I really like nothing more than to simply find a new phenotype and find its cause. Uh, tonight I will talk about how we developed a way to do that more or less instantaneously rather than the old-fashioned positional cloning that went for years sometimes. And that's all I have to say by the way of preamble. But I love genetics and uh, I certainly try to apply it when I can, but I love the act of finding new genes. If you have any questions you've already thought about, please do. I don't want to ask myself. I have 22 questions <laughs> in case, you know, some minutes pass without any questions. But uh, I'd like to ask you to take the stage. First come for serve. Come on. Dr. Van der Jan said the first. Yeah, very good. <laughs> I love it. It's going to be a little bit uh, more of a political one. Uh, well, the crossroads that we are facing, particularly in Europe, the problem of uh, mass genetics and uh, all your position, not only from the green lobbies and uh, people, but also from uh, scientists coming from the clinic. Mm -hmm. They claim, or uh, although we know that it's not true, that the, the issue that uh, also George touched upon a bit earlier on, of clinical translation, how the fighting that we have from mass genetics, to how do they translate the things. And uh, as you know, this also has problems in our funding, because when you go to ask, for example, for a forward screen or a reverse screen, you, particularly in Europe, I don't know if it's the same thing in the States, you face big problems. So what is your opinion on how to overcome this? How can we persuade, should we say, both uh, funders and people that uh, the problem has nothing to do with uh, the approach, but uh, with something else. Thanks very much. Any ideas? Do you accept the question? Sure. Uh, it's a question I hear quite a lot. Um, on the one hand, at the most basic level, sometimes uh, society doesn't even back animal experimentation. And I think most of us would agree that's a backward point of view. When I was a small child, as it happens, I was very passionate about animal welfare. I remember having an argument with my father about this subject because he was a biologist. He experimented with, with mice all the time. Uh, and I told him that uh, if it came to a choice between his life and that of a mouse, the only fair thing to do would be to flip a coin. <laughs> so I was a radical, <laughs> I think more than even most of these people are. And uh, I understand where they're coming from, but at the same time, uh, I think most of society sees that its welfare depends on experimentation and on using animals to try to understand basic principles. Now, the other part of your question has to do with our scientific colleagues. And uh, that's the thing the most striking we have opposition even from people who think uh, medical problems. This is true. Uh, there are those who say and even publish articles claiming that the mouse is not predicted at all what goes on uh, in a human being. And we've all encountered those papers and they're quite easy to confront scientifically. I usually manage it by pointing out that 98% of our genes are represented in the mouse, at least as homologs, 80% as orthologs, and vice versa, it's about the same. And one can rattle off so many instances where the situation is extremely similar in the mouse and the human. We can cite, even from our own experience, a lot of diseases that were found first in the mouse and then later in the human. So I think that can be dealt with. It just takes recitation of the facts, and we will win there. So, you know, basically, the human studies are confined by assessing peripheral blood in the most of the cases, right? And peripheral blood does not necessarily indicate what's going on in the central lymphoid organs. It just fallacy to believe that by doing such studies you will have the complete answers about uh, diseases. 
So these people that they propagate this, that whatever is done in the mouse is not applicable in the human, they are pushing the envelope too much. And they are doing that for political reasons, for their own uh, benefit. Uh, this is not exactly the case. And But standing in study sections in the NIH, it is beneficial if what you put in doing in mice is complemented or supplemented with some experiments in humans. If you implicate a particular gene, etc., we can do some in vitro experiments and demonstrate whether a gene is expressed or when you find a compound, what the response is, etc. So we do not and should not uh, become absolutist and claim that the mouse is worthless and only the human or the reverse situation. Both of them are useful. Furthermore, in the humans, we are not making consomic mice, congenic mice, knocking mice, knockout mice. <laughs> this can be done only in the, the mouse. So how do you, if you implicate the gene in human, how do you demonstrate how that thing affects the disease? There is no way. Whereas in the mouse, you can make all these genetic manipulations and obtain evidences how it affects disease and mechanistic vertical. No, that's not, it's no, no, but that's not saying what the responses to do give to these people that they try to make absolute statements. Thank you. Another question. Um, you it's me? actually a follow-up. So I'm sure you, this is the next question you get. Um, as a human uh, genomicist, I would just like to ask, um, how is the difference in the genetic background of mice um, with a relatively uh, low diversity and all the inbreeding compared to the um, high genetic variation that segregates in humans and that may possibly alter um, phenotypes that could arise in mice but do not or um, do in humans because of interactions of genes and genes with the environment and uh, other factors. Okay, your point is, uh, is a good one. Uh, it's kind of interesting. We think of something like the C57 black 6 strain as totally inbred and uh, homozygous and all those side, and it's really not. I'll talk about that a little bit tonight, perhaps. Uh, but we know of 1,600 mutations now that change coding sets in that strain uh, that. Uh, existed either very high frequency or sometimes very low, but we pick them all up because of the way we do things now. Between strains, if you look at distant uh, moose musculus strains, even without going to moose gratis or uh, moose castaneus, the wild strains, you find more variation than in the <coughs> human population. In general, uh, you don't find, of course, a lot of a huge amount of genetic variability within any of those strains. And that was sort of one reason to do the collaborative cross, which you've probably heard of, to systematically cross eight different strains of moose musculus and then mix them up and make eventually recombinant inbred lines, hundreds of such lines. And then finally one could cross any two of those lines to give something very similar to a human being. All of this is kind of interesting, uh, and it does tell you something about, uh, let's say, the influence of modifier loci. If you try to make a discrete change on a defined but highly mixed background like that, I think that's the way to approach it in the mouse. And uh, no doubt, polygenic disease is the great challenge of our time, and uh, there are ways to approach it. And that, I would say, is one of them. One way of looking for modifier effects. But you're absolutely right in what you're saying. We would never emulate the diversity of the human population with mice. And when we describe, let's say, these lupus mice or the NOD mice that develop diabetes, etc., we are very cognizant that we refer to one individual in the mouth and to three individuals in the lupus predisposed. But the mechanisms unravel and the molecules implicated, they can give us some leads as to how inflammation and systemic autoimmunity and interferences and development of drugs. We do not claim, as I have indicated, 
to my knowledge, there is not any evidence in humans there is any problem in the slide 15A4, for example, as far. Nor we expect that we will find a great percentage of the lupus patients of having problem. Occasionally we see such, for example, the trix tex one which is the DNA strip, is found occasionally to be mutated in humans. The DNA 2 has been found rarely to be mutated in humans. And that gives us suggestions how inefficient digestion of DNA may lead to the engagement of this endosomal DLRs and disease. But always there are few in large numbers of patients that carry these particular mutations. Very well. Please. Any more? Okay. Pastor. Hi. Uh, we'd like to ask you, we're living in the era of genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and we do, especially, uh, we try to sequence um, and understand diseases through sequencing of RNA, of DNA, of, uh, you know, analyzing the sequence of proteins. Do you think that these approaches by themselves are enough for us to get inside into the mechanisms of diseases, or we need to consider other things like more systemic on the cellular level, on the organism level. And there's so much use of this approach, and uh, there have been you know, a hype of all these issues. So what's your opinion? Well, mere sequencing is not enough. Uh, it's nothing without phenotyping, first of all. It is our goal in the mouse to come close to saturation and really to find out uh, every gene that contributes in a non-redundant way to certain phenomena like the ability to make an antibody response or certain aspects of the innate immune response. And we can do that. That is feasible. We are making progress. And I believe we'll come to a point that we know most of the genes that are really important for TLR signaling, let's say. However, that isn't mechanism. It's only the starting point. It's as though you know then all of the components of a machine. And then you have to figure out really how those components work, how they fit together, how they interact with one another, what the critical pathway is. So it's a different question. And the tools there are tools of cell biology, biochemistry, structural biology, all that has to be used in the end. You can't shy away from it. Okay, simply yes. None of them is going to provide the answers. People are doing now systems biology and uh, all the omics that one can think about, and they put hundreds and thousands of hours, particularly the systems biology, or they put a site off to look at every possible market of lymphocytes, but we have to recognize that there is considerable heterogeneity, the definable uh, limited number of uh, D or D populations, perhaps it's inaccurate. There are differences in the transcriptional program. We live in an in vivo setting that we perceive something as being the same B cell. Each one of them is different depending on the location, on the time frame, on the medication that the patient will be receives, etc. But if we started this, you know, multiplication and multiplication in assay systems, there is also the possibility that we may get lost in the depth of analysis that they are made. And that's what I suggested to the uh, uh, vice director of the Arthritis Institute that was attending a meeting in Scott's day. And they are putting now millions of dollars in doing this kind of stuff in tissues, let's say, of rheumatoid arthritis, just in the joint, or in patients with lupus in the kidney. And they are doing this omics, every omics that exists. And I saw some of the results that he was showing, and there were arrows going all over the place. And I challenged him, and I said, you are giving these millions to these people doing this so-called cutting uh, words, and I'm wondering whether this does not obfuscate the issues and causes more difficulties rather than uh, uh, resolving problems. No one has the answer. So let, let it play as it plays and we'll see who is going to prevail. 
Let me add a little bit on, on that by saying that uh, perhaps one interesting advice or an interesting way to follow in the future would be to take from human situations the data, build the hypothesis, and then test in a reverse translational way, test or prove the hypothesis in mice. And this, this would be uh, one of the ways to follow amongst all the others that you suggested. So, we can even change a little bit the direction of the discussion. Let's make it personal. So, uh, um, I can go personal too, but let's, let's stay. Well, I can, don't be concerned. Um, so, we hear, we hear in the recent day, we hear lots of things about treating or boosting the immune system to treat cancers and cancer immunotherapies through checkpoint inhibition or, or <coughs> chimeric cancer receptors, etc. So I wonder whether there is any 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 effort to, to treat the immune disease by using the immune system, if, if this is if this can be done. And what do you expect to happen in the in the field moving forward, let's say in the next five or, or ten years? Chris Good now is quite an authority in that area. He spoke about checkpoints in the development of tolerance, or rather checkpoints that prevent uh, autoimmunity normally. Uh, that applies both with T cells, where there are central and peripheral tolerance mechanisms, and with B cells, which develop uh, the bone marrow and are tolerized to self. They are uh, quite a different mechanism. And all of the molecular uh, checkpoints are certainly not known, but one has to imagine that it's failure of normal checkpoints uh, that used in that sense. We're not talking about, uh, about cancer here, but about autoimmunity. It's failure of those checkpoint uh, molecules to operate that leads to a situation where you can have autoimmunity. We all have lymphocytes that are autoreactive, you and I, all of us, and yet only a few of us really develop an autoimmune disease. And that's quite a, a mystery. And uh, the idea of using the immune system to block the development, I don't know. I've never really thought about that. Maybe Ari might have, because this is the center of his world. So I'll pass the microphone to him now. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, um, I think that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, presumptions as to what causes autoimmunity, and we are led astray uh, by following these presumptions. For example, it happened myself to believe that autoimmunity is not caused by any problems in central process. I do not know anybody, apart of the case of the A mutation, that the problem in central cell tolerance causes autoimmunity. I believe that all of us, as Bruce said, we have a large number of potential autoreactive cells in the periphery, and the issue is how these cells are engaged and under what circumstances. What is my repertoire, which may be different than Bruce's repertoire, what are the circumstances that we engage these cells? Is a matter of regulatory cells? Is a matter of energy? Is a matter of um, uh, stimuli such as the TLRs that they can engage these previously quiescent uh, cells? Is not known. But as you suggested, there are people that are, um, are creating approaches to use the CAR process to eliminate certain cell types that may contribute to autoimmunity. For example, the rituximab is used to eliminate B cells. And simultaneously, CAR uh, T cells are directed in malignancies that recognize CD19. And they cause B cell aplasia. They destroy every B cell. Here, there are efforts to be made that one may eliminate the plasma cells in autoimmunity. Now, checkpoints that you can perhaps interfere as in malignancy, <coughs> that may be very difficult in autoimmunity because there are so many checkpoints as good now and Bruce and others have suggested. So, but there are efforts to use the CAR approach 
in an opposite, ma opposite manner than what it is done in malignancy to eliminate some of the cells that we think as contributors to autoimmune disease, be that plasma cells that make autoantibodies and more specific types of T cell, helper T cells that like T817 that they may contribute to disease. Hello, I, I was wondering how, how do you feel about the intersection of different biological processes, like for example, neuronal control of inflammation, of, or metabolic control of cancer, or... It tends to be how biology works, because we have only about 25,000 genes. In uh, my own area, it was development and immunity that seemed to intersect. Uh, that was apparent first in the fly, where toll was a developmentally important gene since 1994. And this line, full heart, defined the dorsal ventral regulatory cassette and it included toll, and it was really important for flies to develop. And then only much later it was found that uh, it was also important in immunity in flies that had developed properly. Uh, could it be that toll-like receptors, my D88 signaling is important in development in mice? Actually, nobody's looked that carefully. We know that most mice with my D88 not going to die by weaning age. Nobody has looked to see that they're really even born in a Mendelian ratio, though, so it's possible. We see lots of things that affect brain function and coat color and immunity altogether. And it's because molecules are repurposed in different tissues. You can say the same about metabolism, the same about neural function and immunity. But there's a lot of hype, I think, in that field, too. OK, well, I'll be honest about that. I think uh, the field of neuropsychoimmunology has perhaps some true things in it and a lot of things that really don't hold up that well. So you have to be careful. That's like it is with all uh, leading edge sort of work. Yeah, I very much agree with Bruce that there is, um, the immunologists are well known to do that. Every so often there's something cut, and suddenly all immunologists will go like a herd following a particular area or tissue, not, uh, or issue. Right now it's microbiota. Suddenly everything can be explained on microbiota. Some other time it was the regulatory cell. Suddenly there are not only CD4, CD35 regulatory, but the th 17 can be regulatory, the molecular helper T cells can be regulatory, the dominatrix can be regulatory, the gamma delta can be regulatory, and so on and so forth and all of that. So immunologists always, they try to find some answer and frequently they are lost as to what is trendy or not trendy. And as my colleague indicated, Bruce, we have to be very careful in following fanciful ideas. But, you know, just for the real things, lots of mutations, like Ari mentioned, hermonsky Goodlock syndrome mutations affect coat color, affect immunity, absolutely clear. Uh, same with the LISP gene, uh, the AP3 complex. And there are quite a few things that affect neuronal function as well. Uh, it was found by, I don't remember the name of this Russian <coughs> geneticist who looked at foxes and was breeding them for lighter coat colors and found that they became very docile at the same time. It's that, that sort of thing involved in vesicle transport that can affect multiple systems. Thank you. Let me go uh, switch a little bit at this moment and go to what uh, we originally promised here. We promised that this would be an opportunity for younger scientists to ask their type of questions. So far we have discussed very important issues uh, on science. I will change a little bit the um, thematic area perhaps by posing this type of question that I think represents many of the young students and please follow up uh, with even more questions. How a young scientist, be it a student or um, a person who uh, wishes to be successful in, in a project and build a career in science, in research, 
what type of question he should uh, um, follow initially. What are the rules behind the questions that they will pose? What should we expect from them? What's <coughs> up? Really easy to answer. <laughs> you have to love what you're doing, first of all. You have to really be interested in what you're doing. And uh, if you're not, do something else. Uh, but if I had to say what you should do to have the greatest measure of success, then, well, do something that you love. If it is something that uh, is perhaps very important and yet underappreciated as such, that's a good position to be in. If you are working on something that you know is important, but most people do not. Now, uh, I got into that situation myself by going to medical school. Are any of you going to medical school? No, none of you. <laughs> One, well, two. Well, that always, I thought that gave me a kind of an advantage. And there are probably other ways to gain an advantage too, but I felt I understood disease pathogenesis pretty well, having seen a lot of patients with various diseases and having been formally taught about pathology. Uh, so I knew certain problems were important. I knew the endotoxin problem was important, and I was very, very keen to solve it for that reason. Other people might have dismissed this, having never seen someone psychic shock, I suppose. But I thought, how can it be that, uh, that nobody knows about what causes that? Not at all. Nothing known about the receptor. That's something really important to find. If you have some insight into what's important, that's really uh, half the battle. Well, a few words. Persistence, resilience, clarity of thought, and challenge the supervisors. <laughs> not accept what they say. The new things come from people that they are not as enmeshed and embedded in the matters that we address. We tend to be, after certain years, repeating and doing the same things and be focusing or um, attached um, to a certain matter. And we try to put the younger people to address the matter that we believe. We want young people to challenge us and come up to, I used, when I arrived at the Scripps Clinic, I was a physician, I did not know much about basic research whatsoever. So Frank Dixon, my boss, who was the founder of the Scripps Research Institute, had come from Bangkok, uh, Thailand, bringing some sera, and he asked me to check the sera for immune complexes. I began doing something with doubling on the fusion at that time of the wrong technique. I saw some cloudy, clouded lines there. So without fear, I tended to, that's my personality perhaps. I went back to him in his office respectfully, but I told him, Dr. Dixon, I don't want to do this work. And he looked at me, who is this dumb little character that he's challenging me? I said, Dr. Dixon, you don't want me to do something that is irreproducible that something is, that's bad, and therefore I want to do something else. And indeed, he told me that when he was in, uh, in Bangkok and he was checking the dengue patient's peripheral blood, he found that they had much more immunoglobulin on their surface. And he thought always that these are immune complexes. It might have been wrong, but that suggested to me that I could use lymphocytes as in vitro detectors for immune complexes. And that's how I began my career. And I went and I put some Raji cells at that time with some aggregated immunoglobulin as a model for immune complexes with S complement or heated serum. And I saw some positivity for the third complement component. I went back to him and I said, Dr. Dixon, I saw this. He said, that's not possible. I'm going to ask Hans Miller Eberhard, who was the biggest complementologist at that time. And they came back, both of them, and they told me, this is not possible, it's wrong. Fortunately, another younger man had come back from Thailand, and I said, Victor, could I show you what I found? They told me it's not possible. And he was very kind to, stay, to say, hey, let's do it together, let's see. 
we did it together, and it was proven that I was right, I was not dreaming on, and that led me to publish several papers and create a little career for myself. So challenge and have a clarity of thought, and visualize a paper before the time comes to write the paper. You have the paper in your mind, what is the sequence of events, what questions you should ask, and when you do it, no matter what the result, you will have a very good and important paper. You said persistence, and that's true too. Uh, you do have to work very hard. You're in a competitive sort of field. It's not a job, it's a profession. You've got to be very devoted to it. People ask me all the time about life balance. I'm not really answering George's question. It's a personal, it's a personal session. Uh, the balance has to be pretty far towards science. I'm not saying that that's absolutely the only thing in your life, and you never leave the lab, and you never have any children, and you never get married, etc., etc. You're not a mindless automaton or a drone, but you do have to be very devoted to it to succeed, given the competitive nature of science right now and the kind of tough times we're in right now. Thank you again. Please, questions. I would like to ask you, because we're all, uh, we're all just about uh, the impact factor. Here from Greece, trying to do research, even if you have a great idea, it's very difficult to publish in high impact factor journals. Even if you have the greatest idea, because you don't have a big name or a big institute to back you up. So uh, this is my problem right now. I have a great thing to publish, and I get blocked from big journals. Do you have any idea how to? From Greece, it's very difficult. No? Well, it's easy for me to say the impact factor is not important. <laughs> but it's really not that important. What's important is that you publish and you begin to develop a reputation for yourself. And I know too many people who dwell on the impact factor and don't publish and don't publish and don't publish for years, where they might have published several papers and have begun to make some kind of a reputation for themselves. And remember, every year you don't publish is another year of obscurity, and another year of your life wasted, in a way. You can think of it that way. So I would say, more important that you do publish good, accurate, reliable work. And uh, if it's important work, it will be recognized, and it will accrue to your credit. Well, the other day we were, were uh, discussing the issue of the CRISPR-Cas discovery. And there's a very nice article written by Eric Lambert, uh, published in Cell, where he examines the history of this discovery. And I was very much impressed that the first person actually that did discover this microbial immune system was a totally unknown Spanish biologist, very young man working somewhere in the coast of uh, Costa Brava, who has isolated some microorganisms and saw these repetitive elements. He tried to publish it. He sent it to Nature, to Science, to all of these journals, and some of them, stupidity, in a stupidity, they saw, oh, there is nothing novel here in what you described. At the end, the poor man thought that not to be scooped. He published this finding in a secondary journal. So published, it doesn't matter what they call the journal, particularly nowadays that you click in your uh, screen and you can find anything you want. It's going to come out, and if it is important and significant, we will decide it, and you will get the credit for it. Thank you. So as a follow-up, perhaps uh, you can give us some advice on uh, how to feel about open access publishing these days and uh, if there is any system better than the peer review system that could be followed in the future of science. Do you have any thoughts? Well, I think about that quite a lot, actually. My family, in a way, was involved in scientific publishing. My brother and father made this program called Reference Manager, and uh, it was used for a long time, then it was sold to Thompson and finally kind of replaced by EndNote. But we talked about this a lot, 
At one extreme, uh, I used the analogy, what if uh, people in other disciplines, artists, musicians, had to be subject to peer review? What if Johann Sebastian Bach couldn't publish any of his fugues without peer review and his colleagues said, that's far too complicated. A four-part fugue played with two hands, oh no, it can't be done. The well-tempered clavier, never. Um, and he'd had to publish it in some secondary journal and uh, perhaps he wouldn't have uh, gained quite as much traction even posthumously as he did. So what if uh, we each had our own website of the extreme? We don't require any peer review. We just publish what we believe is true. It's subject to some constraints. It can't be uh, modified once it's uploaded. It's always there. There's someone maintaining the system, but no peer review. Some people say horror of horrors. That would be the worst of all. It's hard enough now to distinguish what's true and what's false. On the other hand, it might happen that uh, people would gradually recognize the quality of certain investigators, that their work was reproducible and to be trusted, and they would be cited. There would be a system for citation. I think that's not such a terrible model, although maybe it's a radical opinion. Short of that, the way physicists operate for some time now has been to publish preliminary papers online, and they're respected and they're not scooped. And uh, eventually, they still can publish in a print journal the same material. That certainly I would advocate if it was something that became popular in, in biology. That's very well uh, summarized. But I'm very concerned uh, for some of these open access journals. They come from resources that nobody knows where they are. Uh, everybody has started the immunology journals. You see hundreds of them. They ask us every day to be in editorial boards of uh, journals that we have no idea where they are coming. Are they from a village in Greece, from Saudi Arabia, from India? So I'm very concerned and mindful. And I tend, when I receive such invitations, not even to reply. And thus far, I have not submitted any paper to one of these undefinable open access journals. There are some of them that they are respectable, and as Bruce said, you know, there must be some measure of checking, checkings and balances, otherwise the too open deal uh, uh, can be a little bit dangerous. As we said yesterday, there is a fine balance between immunity and autoimmunity, between being healthy and, and an inflammation that can kill you, and one cannot help wondering that with the medication we, you know, we use today to treat autoimmune diseases, which is a product of um, 20 years old um, basic research, what are we doing? I mean, it takes so much to translate your work into, um, you know, uh, medication or whatever, or clinical treatment. Or. So one feels that we are in the prehistoric age in terms of treatments. Any ideas on how we could speed up things without putting people in danger, of course? Well, if we're talking about anti-TNF therapy, the translation was rather quick. Uh, the interesting thing is that it took only a few years from, from the early discoveries that TNF was inflammatory to the time when people were blocking it for clinical effect. The fact that we're still using that and a few other targeted therapies like that is interesting uh, because in the end, these do not aim at the very primary cause of the disease like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, ankylosing spondylitis, Crohn's disease. Nobody knows the causes. And uh, these are a lot better than simple cytoreductive therapy that people used to get. We used to treat uh, some of these diseases just by wiping out all of the leukocytes, which was very non-specific. This is better than that, but it isn't aimed at the primary cause. To my thought, the primary cause ultimately is uh, mostly genetic, although, as Ari pointed out, there are going to be environmental influences. And to my thinking, 
the best way to get at the questions where a good mouse model exists is to use genetics to look for mutations that correct the phenotype, that prevent disease. For example, in the case of lupus models, if you can find mutations that eliminate SLE, then you have drug targets, like the SLAC15A4 may be a very good drug target. Maybe it will be effective in many different kinds of lupus. Make no mistake, there are probably hundreds of kinds of SLE in human beings. But there might be some ways to mitigate many of them uh, with drugs that target genes where you know a mutation has a mitigating effect. That's the way to speed it up as far as I'm concerned. Well, as the uh, council was trying to illustrate, uh, the involvement, let's say, of endolysosomal TLRs and the production higher of high amounts of type 1 interferons is not unique to lupus. Interferogenic uh, signatures, that is, dominance of uh, factors that, that are involved in the response to interferons, has been seen in almost every inflammatory autoimmune disease. So it is erroneous to think that every autoimmune disease and every individual that has an autoimmune disease in whatever phenotypic characteristics uh, are developed is totally some unique mechanism that causes that disease. There are commonalities in all of these diseases. And very likely, we are going to identify pathways and drugs on which we will affect many of these diseases. An example is the PNF, of course, but many diseases are manifested by hyperproduction of the, it's poliomyositis, dermatomyositis, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, diabetes, all of them are characterized by these things. We can imagine that, for example, in diabetes, there is nothing else but we have a pancreatotropic virus. And this virus causes some initial damage and inflammation in the pancreas, thereby allowing um, availability of the corresponding antigens in the beta cells. So here again, we have damage of cells, uptake of nuclear materials, uh, antigens that are associated with that tissue, but the induction of the aberrant response, although might be directed against the pancreas, is not different than that one seen in loops. So I suggest that as we learn more mechanistically, and in particular from the perspective of the innate responses, we are going to find some uni more uniformly applicable answers to diseases and perhaps not panaceas, but many drugs that will have applicability in more than a particular disease. I can envisage that this will happen. I actually really like your definition, which I've never heard before, neuropsychoimmunology, because most of the people would focus on neuroimmunology or neuroinflammation. So my question would be on this. So it seems that the immune system has developed uh, Specialized populations that are on different uh, tissues and on different organs, and they control and control and see if something goes wrong. And uh, of course, our brain also has evolved uh, uh, different systems that can control and uh, sense what is happening in our body. For example, it seems that our brain can tell what kind of microbiota we have in our, in our gut. So, from this, it seems very clear, obvious, that the immune system should have developed an immune system for the brain, which recent findings on neurobiology clearly shows that uh, astrocytes and microglia are cell population that serve brain functions. And also other, uh, I mean, evidence from uh, systemic uh, immune conditions shows that when something goes wrong in the periphery, clearly you have cells that go into the brain to check if everything goes on or right in the brain. So if you were to, so the hypothesis, if it's a part of the immune system clearly devoted to the brain, and I mean the peripheral immune system, what would you do to find out what is a part of the immune system that uh, controls the brain? You're talking about uh, 
the conventional immune system as we understand it, not simply microglia, which certainly are in the brain, serve the brain, come from a primitive hematopoietic precursor. Uh, I suppose one could probe in any uh, component of the immune system to find cells that are autoreactive with tissues in the brain. This is something one, one could do with MHC tetramers, for example. One can look in that way, but I'm not sure uh, that one can find, let's say, an immune system dedicated to the brain in the sense that you seem to be blind. My general approach to every such question is to use mutagenesis to destroy such a system if it exists, and then uh, try to see the consequences, track it down. But uh, I'm not sure what the screen you have in mind would be. If you could think of a screen, we could find it if it exists. I would go to the phenotype, actually. Well, there's no doubt that there are events that occur specifically in the brain and that the brain has its own immunologic apparatus and we have also systemic immunologic apparatus where there is an inflammation going on in our body many of the produced cytokines can enter the brain and can have effects in that brain it is known that for example IL-1 beta uh, can interact with neuronal cells. So every time you have an inflammation and you produce all these substances, these sub substances need not to break the blood-brain barrier. They can enter into the brain and they can affect luxury functions of neuronal cells. So that's one issue. And the second issue when the damage is confined to the brain. Why? Many of these autoimmune responses that affect uh, diseases in the brain, they are initiated in the periphery. And how now this activate the T-cells in the periphery, they gain access to the brain. First of all, they have to break the blood-brain barrier, and then they have to be reactivated inside the brain. And once they reactivate it there, they can induce destruction of uh, uh, astrocytes or lipodendrocytes, depending on the disease. That's what happened in neuromyelitis optica, a very bad disease that is more severe than multiple sclerosis. That's what happened in multiple sclerosis. These T cells are activated locally in the brain, they destroy the uh, oligodendrocytes, they don't produce myelin, and therefore we have to correct that matter locally. So, what you are suggesting, there are interactions between the periphery and the brain, and it depends what the target cell. You might have manifestations primarily from the central nervous system or the peripheral system. Nothing is isolated in life. Nothing. There are interactions between these various systems. I want to switch again a little bit the gear. We have not much time left, and you should be tired. Um, for instance, uh, I'd like your opinion on multidisciplinarity in education these days. We understand that uh, science is, together with our understanding of complexity, get much more complex in the way that they are approached, in the fields that they are approached. We have, though, Edward Wilson, in his book, Advice to a Young Scientist, and in this book, what was highlighted was that Biologists should not mind at all about mathematics and uh, informatics or bioinformatics. They will find somebody else to do the job for them. So that was quite radical. What's your opinion on this topic? Well, I would tend toward the opposite. I think you should try to understand everything you can. Uh, very important to understand statistics as much as you can. Uh, very important at least to understand the tools that are available in different areas of biology and chemistry, at least to know what is possible and have some idea of how the process works, or else it's very hard to form a collaboration or even to think of one. So uh, that's my opinion. Well, we cannot be men of all seasons. There are things that uh, necessarily we cannot uh, foment. 
that once again uh, my um, teacher, Dixon, used to tell me that, Ari, you don't need any statistics <coughs> if you have a real results. When you start using statistics and manipulating and to show some significance and good shape, then question your results. The real results are clear cut, and in most instances, we don't need, although we all pull the big values, etc. But in most instances, we have something with clarity again. We don't need all the statistics. Plus, how I would know? Somebody, I asked somebody to sequence an autoantibody. It is a receptor gene. The only thing that I have to do to safeguard that this has been done correctly and ask somebody else to duplicate, but I'm not going to be sitting myself and doing and learning every one of these techniques that my staff is applying. It's wrong. But I have to be astute and careful and question when people come with certain results and ask others within the laboratory and even outside of my laboratory to verify but I'm not going to know everything that is going on, technologically speaking, in my laboratory. Dixon was wrong about this. <laughs> <laughs> I told you he was wrong. I told you. And I think this uh, controversy here shows that uh, the discussion can go on and on and on and on in all issues. And that's the message, perhaps, uh, today. We thank both. Uh, uh, our speakers today for uh, again their time and effort to stay with us and for the wisdom that they share with us and um, thank you all for being here thank you for the inspirations those days.